I'm feeling it. <clears throat> but we we've got to press on because we've got we've got major stuff to work through today. Today is not an easy day. I would say on the basis of having done the reading, you guys get that impression too. There's like some really complicated stuff going on in book two of Locke's essay concerning human understanding. We talked primarily about book one at our last meeting, right? What's the big takeaway from book one? If you had to sum it up. Sure, Thomas. No innate ideas. Yeah, that's, that's exactly how I, how I have it in my notes right now. It's like, book one, no innate ideas. And John Locke doesn't just like establish this by fiat. He doesn't just say like, henceforth, there shall, there shall be no innate ideas. That's not all. Well, he does kind of say that, but like he's got an argument for why. Why no innate ideas? How, how does he make this argument for why it is that the idea of innate ideas just seems to like not be an idea worth holding on to? There's at least a couple of ways that he makes it. Yeah, Delore. He said like things can I, can, can, can I be in... Um Things can't both be and not be at the same time and in the same respect. This was one of the ideas that we talked about as a candidate for an innate idea. In fact, it seems that like Locke is portraying the innatus. He says like they're going to make certain claims. He's got some idea of like what the argument from the other side looks like. And he says they're going to say that there are ideas just like that which is, is, and that which is not, is not, and cannot be, or things can't both be and not be at the same time and in the same respect, or maybe even ideas like two plus two equals four, or squares have four sides, or something like that, that are good candidates for innate ideas. Why are they good candidates for innate ideas? Because, um, is it because, like, the universal assent? Yeah, because they have universal assent. And this seems to be the argument that the, not lock, mind you, but the innatists are making. Locke identifies that this is an argument. This is kind of like a fantasy interlocutor that he has, a fantasy opponent. Not a fantasy. He doesn't just make it up. There are people that he's talking to who make this kind of argument. That like probably an innate, innate it's a tough one to get out of your mouth, right? Probably there are innate ideas because there seem to be ideas with universal assent. Dusty, you had your hand up. Yeah, uh, like the idea of an infant not knowing anything. Uh, tabula. tabula rasa. That's the, yeah, that's another version of, like, if there are no innate ideas, then, like, we're born without any innate ideas, tabula rasa then, right? That's where we end up with this. I'm kind of curious about the in-between. Do we remember? Because the in-between, for my money, the in-between was the interesting part. Not just that Locke says. Everybody's born a tabula rasa, their mind a blank slate. A blank paper, we might say. A blank sheet of paper. With no innate ideas. How does he establish this? We're, we're warm. Deloria identified something to do with universal assent. But as I, I hope demonstrated in kind of like walking back through that, that's part of the argument that the pro-innate ideas folks are trying to make. There are probably ideas that are innate because there seem to be ideas with universal assent. We talked a little bit about how it's not clear whether or not that argument works. Even if there were ideas with universal assent, it's not clear if like ideas with universal assent is going to mean there are innate ideas. We can probably see how it's the other way around, that if there were innate ideas, then there are probably going to be, at least if we all share those innate ideas, then there are gonna be ideas with universal assent because we can all go back and like check that innate idea and be like, yep, I've got it too. Maybe these are ideas like idea of like the thinking self. Maybe they're ideas like the idea of an infinite being, like God. Maybe these are platonic ideas like the form of the good or the beautiful or justice or something like this. But the innatists all say like everybody's born with it already there. And the fact that there are universal assent, uh, that there is universal assent about some of these ideas and we entertain a couple of candidates, that means that there are probably innate ideas. Locke questions whether or not that argument works, and on top of that, he says, dot, 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 you fill in the blank. Children, children and idiots. Children, what about children and idiots? That seems like a strange non sequitur. Like innate ideas, yes, but children and idiots. What? Like, what's going on here? Why are children and idiots relevant to the question of whether or not they're innate ideas or ideas with universal assent, 
right? Which have somehow now been connected in the argument. Yeah. Because um, they, they perceive ideas differently. They perceive ideas differently. Like they have, they maybe have the same ideas, but they're looking at them in a different way than everybody else, or. Possibly, yeah. They don't have the language for it. Yeah. That certainly seems to be part of it. You guys are like, we're hazily remembering this argument, which I remember working out relatively clearly on the board. Sharpen things up just a little bit. Are there innate ideas according to Locke? No. no. All right, we got that part. <laughs> Why? Well, it seems to be that the argument for innate ideas goes through universal assent. Are there ideas with universal assent? No. no. Why not? Because there's always somebody who's not going to understand you. Children and idiots, namely, right, are examples of folks who just would not. It's not that they are thinking of these ideas differently. It's not that they have trouble expressing the ideas. They seem to not have these ideas. Children and idiots do not have the idea that 2 plus 2 equals 4 or all squares have four sides. At least that seems to be the case. They wouldn't assent to it, at least. If we're trying to make the argument... If there are ideas with universal assent, then there are innate ideas. Locke saying, you can't make that argument because there are no ideas with universal assent. Just taking the example of children and idiots will demonstrate that there are no ideas with universal assent. And then there's a little bit of kind of like trying to weasel around it, including ways that Taylor was identifying here, that like maybe they have the idea, but they don't know how to express it yet. Maybe they have the idea, but they're not, they don't know the route to it in their mind because they're not using reason. Maybe these are ideas that eventually, if you spent enough time with somebody, you could get them to agree with it, and then they would come to assent. But Locke says, those don't sound like innate ideas. Those sound like Acquired ideas, yeah, adventitious ideas is what Descartes called them, that they're ideas that you come to or that you make on your own. So we have this no universal assent. And all the, can all the good candidates are all the ways around the fact that there seems to be no universal assent because of things like... That things, children, uh, no, not children, uh, like, yeah, people, I suppose. Maybe ch are children people? Yes. And idiots too? Yes. Okay, good. There are some people that like seem to not be willing to grant universal assent to these sorts of things. You right? What is that? It's a small robot that's recording me. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, I know. Like, try not to be dazzled by the robot. I'm up here doing philosophy. <laughs> No universal assent because of children and idiots. And also Locke kind of eventually comes to this point where he's saying, like, those don't sound like innate ideas, those sound like acquired ideas. And generally, this notion that you have an idea that you haven't had yet, this notion of that like I'm in our reflection draft, I'm calling these unconscious ideas. This seems to be the way that Locke puts it is nearly a contradiction. And I'm curious what the nearly part means there. This is why I've given it to you as a, a writing prompt. He says, this seems to be nearly a contradiction. And I think this gives us a good window into how it is that John Locke is thinking about an idea. An idea that you are not, that you are not currently thinking and you have never thought before. That has never been entertained in your mind. In what sense would we even call that an idea? In what sense would we call it yours? If you're saying, it's mine because it's lying dormant somewhere in my soul, you said, like, but you haven't thought it ever. It's never, been, it's never been presented to your mind. So whatever that thing is, I don't see how we can call that an idea because ideas are the things that you think. This is what it means to be an idea, is that it's thought. We get another little bit of a separation when... Locke starts talking about simple and complex ideas when he's talking about simple ideas, and particularly simple ideas that come from sensation. He identifies that the sense impression is not the idea yet. The idea comes from the sense impression. It's got to be thought. It's got to be entertained in the mind. We'll make sure that we, we like rehearse that quite a bit when we start talking here about simple and complex ideas. Unconscious ideas seem to nearly be a contradiction, just the very notion of an idea that you have but have never had, or an idea which is a thing that is thought but you've never thunk it, or perhaps nobody's ever thought this idea. 
in what way do we say that that's an actual idea? It seems like we're, we're, we're confusing ourselves, perhaps, if we, if we talk like that or if we think like that. Does that seem like fairly plausible? Are we on board with this notion that there's a, there are some big problems with assuming that people have innate ideas, and if there are such big problems, then we should start with this assumption instead, that everybody's born a blank slate, a tabula rasa. And this condition that we're talking about, being born a blank slate, a mind with no ideas, this should be at least a little bit familiar to us because we've been in this position before. We were in this position with Rene Descartes at the end of Meditation 1. By the end of Meditation 1, he said, like, get rid of all the ideas, right? Completely clean house. We're starting over with radical methodological doubt. And Descartes finds us a way out of that, that kind of the darkness and wilderness of, like, no ideas. And I hope I made it clear that, like, that's an impressive move to start with no ideas and then suddenly be like, and now an idea out of nothing, out of nowhere, which, boop, I'm thinking I exist as a thinking thing. Like, I know all these things suddenly. And Descartes has found a rational way out of that kind of starting place of having no ideas. John Locke is doing something slightly different. John Locke is finding us an empirical way out of this blank slate. He's identifying that, like, when you start off, you have no ideas, nothing to reflect on. This is the thing that seems so amazingly exotic about what Descartes was claiming to do in Meditation 2 that he has no ideas, and simply by reflecting on his own thought, own thought, how can you think without ideas, right? Simply by reflecting on his own thought, he comes up with like a new idea, and it's like, wow, that's, that certainly is strange. Something weird is going on, even if Descartes isn't making huge errors in trying to make that move. But Locke is showing us that, like, no, it's through sensation that you start to get your first ideas, and then all the other ideas you make out of those. And this seems like a big part of how it is that an empiricist is going to have to account for how it is that we come to our ideas. This is a big part of his project where he's talking about, like, where do our ideas come from? How do we come to have them? How reliable could they be on the basis of how we come to have them? How is it that we're going to have any kind of confidence in these ideas if we don't have the absolute certainty that folks like Descartes are looking for? How is it that we're going to have some kind of confidence with respect to the ideas that we have that come from sensory experience? Yes? It's like how, like, when you're a little kid, you can't, like, have, you don't have, like, a number of anything until, like, you're about, like, four, like, three or four, or something, like, start growing more than yeah, that, that might be like into some more exotic aspects of Locke's account of mind, which is going to have to apparently run through memory, right? If I've thought something and then I'm going to say like, well, now I've had the idea. Do I still have it if I'm not currently thinking it? Like, think about a banana. You thinking about it? Now think of some grapes. Now think of a donkey. You're not thinking about the banana anymore, right? Because you've like gone from banana to grapes to donkey. What happened to that idea of banana when you stopped thinking about it? It went away. It went away? Yeah. Like it's, it's not like lying dormant in your mind waiting to be thought? No. That's going to be weird, right? Then like how does memory work? Hmm, I don't know. Yeah, this is certainly going to be complicated. We've got our hands full like not even getting into memory. But there are, some, there are a couple of places where Locke is flirting with memory in the reading assignments that we had, and what he does with it is actually quite fascinating. If we are doing well on time, which I don't know like how optimistic I should be about that. If we're doing well on time, by the end of class, there are some questions that we're going to ask, like about personal identity. What does it mean for you to be you? It's a pretty important idea. It's the first idea that Descartes comes up with after Meditation 1, right? The idea of yourself. How is it that you come up with that idea? And a big part of it might have to do with memory. Yeah. Okay. Cool, cool, cool? Cool, cool? 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 Cool, cool? Cool. Book two. Which is all about... The kinds of ideas, the entirety of book two, which is a long book in comparison to book one. Book two is the, it's the bulk of Locke's essay. We only had little bits and pieces aside from it. Those of, did you guys notice that in the assignment? It was like this chapter and this chapter, not like all of them, right? If you tried to read all of them, it was like 180 pages or something like that. Okay. <laughs> um, which, you know, by, like, go for it. It's good stuff. But I, I get that people have time constraints. Um, book two is all about the kinds of ideas we have and where they come from, how we get them. 
And he starts off by addressing this, like, how do we get ideas? And Locke says, there are two, exactly two, only two. These are the only two sources of your ideas. Sensation. And what's the other one? Let's, let's try this again. I'm going to ask sensation, and then what's the other one? And for the camera, it'll be like really good, like everybody was right on board there. All right? Only these two ways that you can get ideas, sensation and whew, reflection. reflection. Yeah, good. We can have ideas that come from sensation, or we can have ideas that come from reflection. Those are my only two options. Let's even color code them just to let us know that they are two different sources of ideas. Sensation and reflection. You can think of sensation as a kind of, it's an outer sense. Sensation is everything that comes through your empirical senses, your sights, your sounds, your smells, your tastes, your touches. Maybe we have some other forms of sensation as well. Six senses being able to see dead people or something like that, right? Uh, a sense of like kinesthetic awareness of where your body is in space that's not really quite touch, but is like somehow like something else. Um, that's what we're talking about with sensation. It's a kind of an outer sense, whereas reflection is this, it's kind of like this little pivot that your attention can make, where instead of attending to all of the things that, that are coming through, all the impressions that are coming through your sight, hearing, smell, like all of those sensory faculties, you just attend to what's going on in your mind. Is it clear enough that these are not quite the same thing? That reflecting on like what's going on in your mind is not quite the same thing as attending to what you are sensorily perceiving. Mm -hmm. That they are two ways in which like ideas can be presented to you, either through your senses or like on the stage of like your mental reflection. But it seems, and remember Descartes was saying that like, I can turn my attention at will between these as well. Locke seems to be identifying this as well. That like you can seemingly, insofar as you have like any control over your own thinking at all, you can change where your attention is, either to outer senses or to inner senses, either to sensation or to reflection. There are some weird things then like some weird kind of like conceptual hiccups that are gonna come along with this, but first, let's take a question. Also I mean, also I mean, Lots, like, reflect, like, lots who responds to, um, the, I think the guy named Mon Yeah, Stefan Molyneux. Mr. Molyneux's, like, kooky proposal, which is, like, and this is when he starts talking about ideas that come from sensation, right? Yeah. It's the, the question of, like, what if, do you remember what was the scenario? It was, like, a little thought experiment. Like, a blind man, like, if a blind man, um, like, he can't see the object, but, like, he can, like, like, I guess feel it and, like, and maybe not even magically, maybe medically, medically, right? Yeah, there's an Oliver Sacks story that got turned into a movie with Val Kilmer and I think Mira Sorvino that didn't do too well. I think it's called At First Sight, of course. And about a guy who's been blind and then gets a surgery that restores his vision. And it's all about like, what's that like? And that's an interesting question, right? What's that like if you've never seen anything and then one day you can see? What's the question that Molyneux asks about this? Um, it's about like a cube, right? <coughs> yeah, it's like... Yeah, can you tell the difference between a cube and a sphere? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just by sight, right? Yeah, yeah. That this guy has learned cube and sphere in his life, but not through sight. He's learned it through some other sensory modality. He's learned it through touch, perhaps, right? And so he knows the difference between a a cube and a sphere, but he's never seen a cube or a sphere before. And the question is, if we suddenly restored his sight and we showed him a cube and we showed him a sphere, do we think that he would be able to tell the difference between the two and identify which is which? And what does Locke say? He said, like, I think he says, like, probably not because, like, he has been learning. He has learned it again. Because he's never had the sensory impression before. And because he's never had the sensory impression before, he's never had the idea. He's never had that version of the idea. Perhaps he's got an idea of, like, square of like cube and sphere but not an idea that like comes through that particularly that particular sense modality and so no he's not going to be like with some training he'll be able to acquire the idea of cube or sphere as they look 
but he wasn't born with it, and he can't get how they look out of just touching. This is a good place. Like, I want to talk about this some more, but I feel like I've got to get, like, a couple of other things on the board first. Cool if we do that, and then we'll come back to Mr. Molyneux? All right. Cool. Before I put those things on the board, and just so I don't forget, I'll mark what the things that I was going to put, the board, put on the board were. Concerning simple ideas. Like, what's up with simple ideas? All right, that's the next thing. But first, before we even get to that, this business of, like, I can turn my attention to my senses or to reflection that, like, seems so intuitively obvious to us, how does that work? That's a little peculiar, I think. Are you thinking of it like this? Because I find this is how I tend to think of this, that, like... That's my head. And there's my eyeball. And there's like stuff coming into my eyeball from the world, light stuff. And then there's like a lens and it gets inverted and like projected on my retina. And then like after it gets projected on my retina, there's like da 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 da. It's not sight yet, by the way, right? Is it sight before it hits my eye? It's just it's just light traveling, right? It's not it's not a, a it's not a sight. It's not anything that I'm. There's no seeing. What about once it goes into my eye? Is it seeing? No. No. What about as it's traveling down my optic nerve? Is it seeing? No. no. It's only when like it becomes evident in the theater of my mind. Only when my mind like attends to the to the perception, then there's sight. Okay. So this goes to the theater of my mind. And either I can attend to what's going on in there, or I can attend what's going on in there that's coming from sensation, I guess. Or I can attend to what's going on in there that's not from sensation. Wait, it's not? Are they in the same place? First of all, is there really that big of a difference between sensation and reflection? When I think about sensation, am I not reflecting on like what is present to my mind right now from sensation? And while you're thinking about that, Are we thinking of it like some movie screen that like the scenes are being shown on and like we can cut away from like what the eyes are presenting and then instead we can cut away to what the mind is thinking about? Who's watching this movie? Is there like when you try to model this in your own mind, is there like a little a little man or a little woman <laughs> who's like in there and that's me. That's the ego cohito. Bingo, <laughs> ego cohito watching the movie. Cuz it is that, is that how you tend to think about it? When pushed? How are you thinking about it? Mitchell. Well, I, I kind of identify with that sometimes because when you're, I think, in, your, in the midst of an experience that's meaningful to you, you can kind of feel like it's playing out as like a movie. And, and that's reflection. Maybe that little, that little extra bit of distance. Like I'm sensing it, but I'm also like aware, like this is me sensing this. Like that's that little that little filter that we say, like, that's reflection, actually, not sensation. Sensation would be, like, the raw feed as it's, like, coming in. Yeah. But even still, yeah, we've got this notion that, like, insofar as there's, like, a perspective that can shift either to my senses or to, like, reflection. Who's got that perspective? That's me, right? That's the ego coito, like a little man sitting in my brain watching a movie watching a couple of different movies, like lots of screens. He's in like mission control and he's just like, well, let's look at this. Ah, like, feels like my toe's on fire. Let's look at this one. Oh my God, it is on fire. Like I feel pain. Let's go to like the emotion screen. Like, yep, pain is happening and sadness and all of these things. If it was like that, then does anybody, can anybody recognize there's a problem at work here, which is like, how does this little person watch the movie? Do they have a mind of their own that a movie comes in and it plays on the screen and then another little tiny person inside their head? And then like, how does that person see? It goes on and on and on and on. 
This is a big problem. It's usually referred to as like the homuncular problem. Homunculus means little man, like the little person inside your head. If you're thinking of perception and even reflection in these terms of a homunculus that can redirect their attention to a different screen, watch out, because there's serious problems with this. There's this infinite regress of like, how does your homunculus perceive? Because he's got his own little homunculus and then so on and so on forever. That's not going to work. But yet still, this seems intuitively obvious, two sources of ideas from sensation or from reflection. Those are the only ways that you can get ideas. Perhaps the innatists are right and we access those innate ideas through reflection, but it seems like the innatists are wrong from everything that we said before. Simple ideas. Locke starts getting into, I think, like what is maybe the most helpful sort of a trope that he follows all throughout book two, which is in other ways a really nasty mess in places, but he just makes categories for us. And I think this is, whenever you see a philosopher doing this, I would recommend that, like, attend to this. Whenever a philosopher says, there are two kinds of X, be like, that's totally going in my notes. There are two kinds of X. There are two sources of our ideas, sensation and reflection. That should be a big bullet pointed, like, part of your notes. Simple ideas. Simple ideas as opposed to complex ideas, which is like what we're going to talk about later from, I think it's chapter 12 onwards. This is chapter 2 through 11 in book 2. And chapters, chapter 12 on like well into like 33, etc. Like that's all the conversation about complex ideas. And this is critical for Locke because he's saying, like, look, I'm going to try to give an account for where all of our ideas come from. None of them are innate. We're not born with any of them. So they're either coming from sensation or they're coming from reflection. Of the simple ideas, the ones that are not complex, nobody's like, they're simple ideas. Like, they're the ones that are not complex. And you're like, oh, I get it. We can move on. All right. Of the simple ideas, there are four kinds. There are simple ideas from one sense only. Examples of a simple idea that I just get from one sense only. Yeah, Nick. Color, yeah. Totally. You don't get color through your smell. No synesthetes in the room. You don't get color through your hearing. We'll talk about like blue notes or something like that, but that's a figure of speech. Nothing actually sounds blue. Nothing smells blue, except maybe in like figurative language. It's not the same blue when I say that sounds blue or that smells blue. Things only look blue. It's a color. Tones, only through hearing. You only get tones through hearing. Warmth. You only get warmth through touch. Something can look as if it might feel hot if I touched it. I don't know. Is red a warm color? Is that figurative or is that literal? Like red is warm the same way that a puppy is warm? It's a different sort of a thing? Okay. Keep track of this. We might have like same word, different concept. But remember, what we're tracking here is the ideas, not the words. Locke takes up words and language in book three of the essay. You had just a teeny tiny taste of that in your reading assignment if you made it that far. I don't think there were just a couple of questions on the reading quiz about it. Book four is all about like the confidence we can have our, in our ideas, an important topic, but we're not reading any. We're going to pass the torch off to Hume for that. But yeah, remember, we're sticking with not words, but with ideas, the concept of warm. Even though I might say this looks warm, that's not the same concept as the warmth of feeling. Because color, tone, warmth, coolness, those sorts of things, these seem to be simple ideas that come from one sense only. Ray. That come from more than one sense? Uh, no, not that come from one sense. Oh, okay. Because uh, that's the next one. Yeah. Uh, color that inspires like, feeling like warm and such. And those like, simple ideas also are like, uh, from reflection or the complex ideas. 
Those are, those are ideas, I would say, in unusual humans. If, it, like, if a sight actually gives you the, the like, tactile feeling of warmth, then you have what is usually referred to as synesthesia, which is like some kind of crossing of like associations between one sense modality and another. And it's a fascinating topic that like Stefan Molyneux and John Locke seem to not have on their radar, but it's the sort of thing that like folks will talk about today when they're in conversations kind of like this. How does sensation happen? What do we do with people who have abnormal, abnormal, yeah, abnormal, not normal brains. Like they might be superhumans. In fact, a lot of like really talented musicians or chefs and writers sometimes do have exactly this. They'll say that words, or I know mathematicians that say numbers have colors. Like the number three is just blue. And you're like, really? And you're like, like whenever you see it, you picture a blue three, and they're like, yeah, it's kind of like that. But also like the sound of somebody saying three sounds blue to me, and I'm like. I don't know what you're talking about there. Your brain definitely works differently than mine does. But for normal people, which are hard enough to figure out, normal people, and this is, this is like both maybe excusable, but also maybe one of the big problems in early modern philosophy is that it's for the most part a bunch of rich white dudes with the occasional rich white woman participating in the conversation saying, here's how normal minds work. And like, what minds does John Locke have to base his, his statements about this on? His own mind, yeah. He's not like a practicing empirical psychologist. He's kind of like gesturing in the direction of a, a science of the mind. And you're like, science of the mind, that's psychology. But there is no psychology yet. There are just philosophers who are saying, somebody should do a science of the mind. Let me look at my own mind and figure out how this works. You can excuse them, I think, because it's really awful difficult to look at somebody else's mind. As Descartes pointed out, you don't even know if other people have minds. But if we're going to try to think about, like, how do minds come up with ideas? He reflects on his own. And he's not a synesthete. So he talks about these ideas from one sense alone and says things like color and aroma and what's that? Tastes? Yeah. Like all the basic things, right? from one sense alone. Next category, from multiple senses. Yeah. What are some examples of ideas that come from multiple senses? Yeah, Taylor. Could taste be? Because you can partly like taste with your, your nose, right? Yeah, I think this is, yeah, so maybe, but if I was going to try to rescue taste as something that's from one sense only, I would say what we do is we, when we talk about how things taste, we're not really only talking about how they taste, we're kind of combining how they smell and how they taste. We might say there are really only, what, five tastes? Sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and umami. And like, aside from those, everything else that you say you taste, you actually smell. Sunshine is one. Sunshine? Oh, yeah. Is a taste? Because it um, comes from multiple senses. <laughs> oh, sunshine comes from... Ooh, is sunshine a simple idea? Yeah. You might... Yeah, I, I, I like where you're going. Is it because it feels warm on my skin and it looks bright to my eyes? Doesn't really sound like anything. Well, unless you, like, turn all your satellites towards it and listen, in which case it sounds like big explosions, right? It's just like... <laughs> Don't think you can separate the idea of sunshine from warmth in your life. Yeah, sunshine might not be a simple idea. It might end up being a complex idea, but I like where you're going with this. Maybe some other examples. Yeah, Brian? Uh, shape, size, rest in motion. Yeah, shape and size or extension, right? Uh, rest in motion, he mentions. Let's. If we're just going to put one example on the board, shape is a, a nice kind of paradigm example. And as we were talking about with Mr. Molyneux, he was pointing out that the blind person can have ideas about shape. They get them through touch. If you're a particularly like skilled hearer, and some blind people are, you can get shape through hearing. Bats get shape through hearing, right? You can get it through touch. Maybe you can get it from he through hearing, and you can get it through sight. And let me ask you, like, when you talk about 
a sphere, the kind of sphere that if you closed your eyes, you could feel it and you're like, that's a sphere. And when you see a sphere and you look at it and you say, that's a sphere, is it the same idea? They're like both the same sphere. Maybe differently than you might say, like red is a warm color or I have warm feelings towards my wife. Like that maybe is figurative, not literally warm, like a puppy is warm or like the fire is very warm when I stick my hand in it. Like those might be slightly different uses of the word, but when I talk about the sphere that I feel and the sphere that I see, that's the same idea, those are both a sphere. If so, then this is the sort of thing that Locke is talking about when he says, from multiple senses, I get the same idea of triangle or any shape really, or extension or rest or motion, and I get them from lots of different sense modalities. And that's different than colors, tones, etc. Good here so far? So this is Locke just kind of like walking us through the various species of simple ideas. And through doing that, we're getting a sense of how it is that simple ideas work. In fact, we're also getting a sense of like how ideas that come to us through the senses work. And how it is that like when we start with nothing, when we start with a blank slate, the first things that like kick off any kind of thought process are some ideas start coming to me from my senses. Sometimes they come from one sense alone. Sometimes it's the same idea coming from multiple senses. Cool. Next category. Good. Right on there. From reflection. And frustratingly, in the first treatment on this, he just kind of passes over. He's, he doesn't really give us too many examples of ideas from reflection alone. He mentions that this is totally a category, and then he says, like, we'll get back to this in just a moment, and perhaps rightly so. We'll follow his lead and, like, skip over it just for a moment to talk about the fourth one first, or third. What's the last category? Sensation and reflection together. And you might have been tempted to be from multiple reflections, but like, no, 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 no. From sensation and reflection together. What are some examples of this? Ray. Uh, this example is like pleasure Pleasure and pain, yeah. Let's start with those for just a moment because they seem to be paradigmatic examples. Can you get pleasure from sensation? Can you see something that is pleasant? And smell something that is pleasant? You can smell things that are unpleasant as well, right? Like maybe that one was like, definitely you can smell unpleasant things. Can you smell pleasant things? Like, yeah, yeah, I guess so too. Can you see unpleasant things? Yeah. Can you see pleasant things? Yeah, okay, I get these through sensation. Can you reflect on ideas and get pleasure and pain as well? And they're the same pleasure and pain? It's not like warmth when I say like red is a warm color, but it doesn't really feel warm. It's not the same thing as like the feeling of warmth. It's just a figurative use. That sensory pain and reflective pain, what are the, like how would you get pain from reflecting? Like reflect on the idea of a busted relationship or something like that and you're like, ooh. Yeah. Reflect on the idea of justice Corrupting and you're like, oh. Cor corrupting an experience to only reflect on the negative parts of it because everything is not always completely if we're talking about reflecting on an experience and like pulling pieces apart, again, ooh, you, you're jumping ahead. We're talking about complex ideas, right? But still hanging out in simple ideas. I, again, you're on the right track. But yeah, ref, you reflect on an experience and you feel pain. Presuming that, can you get that in a simple way, not in a complex way? And that pain is the same kind of thing. Experience through a different kind of like modality instead of through sensation, it's through reflection. Might put it this way. Is emotional pain another kind of the same sort of thing as physical pain is? They're both pain. One is one kind of pain, another one is a different kind of pain, but they're both the same thing. They're both pain. They're very connected. Yeah, okay. So are we buying it? Pleasure and pain come both from the senses and from reflection? What kinds of ideas come from reflection alone? Sense of, 
That's how Descartes worked it out, right? Maybe the self. That ends up being really complex ideas again. You're on a roll here. Maybe a complex idea. Yeah, simple ideas just from reflection alone. It's an exercise worth doing here because I think in, in kind of directing you to this, either Locke directing you to this or you kind of finding it on your own does a really, I think, a, a big job in trying to give us a sense of like, how does this process begin? How do I start with nothing? How do I start with tabula rasa and I start getting ideas? They start coming in from one of two places, either from sensation or reflection. We worked through trying to get a, a sense, so to speak, trying to get a grasp of what it means for ideas to come to us from sensation. Sensation and reflection. What about reflection alone? What does it mean for a simple idea to come from sensation? I'm uh, sorry, to come from reflection. Gloria. He's a uh, long thing, like remembrance, uh, reasoning. Yeah, remembrance, reasoning. Uh, perception is one that he mentions. He says, in fact, this is the first idea that you ever get from reflection alone. It might be the first idea that you ever get, ever. And it's the idea of perception. Really, really close. Mitchell was saying the self, and like Descartes kind of like blurs all these things together. There's like, uh, uh, like I realize that I am perceiving, which is one mode of thought. So there's got to be a thinker of the thought. Ah, I exist, and I'm a thinking thing, right? But notice that was kind of like there was a little bit of a stepwise process there for Descartes. And Locke is pointing out that like the very first time that you ever turn your attention to reflection you'll notice like what's going on right now. If there's anything at all to watch on that movie screen for him, your homunculus, it's going to be that like I'm perceiving something, right? I'm perceiving things that are coming in from my senses or perhaps I am reflecting on something. There's perception, what he calls thinking. All for, through the, the, the faculty of the mind that Locke calls the understanding. There's another faculty of the mind called the will. That might be, a, is, that, is that familiar? We saw Descartes do the same thing. Two faculties of the mind, the understanding and the will. Locke follows suit. There's the understanding and the will. So volition maybe is another simple idea that I get from reflection alone. I will something. I reflect on like, what am I doing right now? I am willing. I have this, this simple sense of volition, of the will at work. I have the simple sense of my senses at work, a simple sense of perception. And that comes to me from reflection, a simple idea just from my attention going to like my own mental operations in which I find something like perception, something like volition, something. What were some of the other examples that you had there, Deloria? Oh, he, he mentioned... Um, uh, um, Remembrance, yeah. Reasoning judging. Reasoning, judging, all of these like simple things, these activities of my mind. Like, what do you find when you look at your mind? That's what reflection is, looking at the theater of your mind. What do you find? Well, you find those activities of your mind, and boom, those are some of your first simple ideas. They're simple ideas that come from reflection alone. Not through sensation, right? You don't get a sense of willing or perceiving by looking at sensations. You get a sense of perceiving by looking at your mind getting inundated with sensory impressions. How are we doing here? This is like tough going. We're like doing the same kind of like bootstrappy project, but as I mentioned, we're doing it through this empirical route now. This is like how do you start with no ideas and start to have some ideas, simple ideas at first, either that come to me from sensation or reflection, and then we can move on to complex ideas where I start taking those simple ideas and I start putting them together or breaking them apart. Yeah, Kevin. Um, how are simple ideas that come from reflection alone different than How are simple ideas that come from reflection alone different from innate ideas? If they don't involve any sensation. Yeah, then how could we not say that they were innate, right? Um, because if we notice our example here, perception, you don't have to start with the idea of perception. You just have to recognize that it's happening. But you don't look to your, sensa your sensation for it. You look to your mind having the sensation. That kind of like one little level of removal that we were saying, like that seems like what reflection is. So you didn't start with it. You got it the same way that you get ideas from sensation, but just another source. The fact that there is a source of that idea 
tells me that it's not innate, right? If it was innate, then it would have no source. It would just be there. The fact that we have to explain like how it comes. And we might also think that, like, well, first you have to have sensations, and then you have to have the idea of, like, this is me having the sensation. We go, like, actually, that's something different, right? The idea that I'm having sensation is now an idea from reflection alone, not the idea from sensation. Does that help at all? Okay. That wasn't the most elegant way of answering that, but we got the point across. Ray. Positive ideas? Um, how do you mean? As opposed to negative ideas? Chapter 8 of book 2? This is when he's talking about the simple mode of space, chapter 8. Um, some proof points about our simple ideas. Chapter, yeah. Book 2. Book 2. We have books, chapters, and sections in this, right? Book 2, chapter, book two, chapter 8. Oh, I was looking at chapter 13. Apologies. <laughs> Because it seems to me that a negative idea might be a complex idea, right? It's starting with a simple idea and then saying not this, right? But perhaps he's talking about uh, some further points about our simple ideas. Blah, 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 blah. That person will present itself to the mind as a positive idea, even if it is caused by a negative feature of the object. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The question is, like, what's he talking about there? So even if we might say that... Let's say a hole. Yeah, an absence of something. Can you perceive a hole? And maybe like what you perceive is actually the absence of the wall in like this spot, but Locke is pointing out that like when you perceive it, you may very well positively perceive the negative thing, right? You might say like that's a hole, and the idea of a hole comes to you. Perhaps this is I would say would you say the idea of a hole is a simple idea from multiple senses. I can feel the hole. I can see the hole. Yeah. yeah, and actually, I think what we're going to see, and this is going to, I think, vindicate Mitchell to a large extent, this distinction between simple and complex ideas well, it ends up looking really, really slippery. As a matter of fact, John Locke totally talks about some things as simple ideas and then later on talks about those same ideas as complex ideas. And part of this might be that like, an idea can be simple or complex depending on how you're taking it. That, like, for example, um, a baseball team is like nine guys, but also it's like a baseball team. You can think of the baseball team as like a conglomeration of things, as a complex thing. You can also just get the concept in a kind of a simple way all in one. Does that make sense? And so we can say the same thing about negations as well. Sometimes they're presented as like positive things, like death, which we might say like death is just the cessation of life. So really death is a complex idea. And we might say like, well, death is a complex idea for other reasons because it's a mode, but also maybe like I can think of death as like just one thing, as like an event instead of like the cessation of some event which makes it complicated that way. Does that help at all? Yeah. Okay. Does it help with anxiety about death at all? No. No? Okay, good. Yeah. That'd be a tall order. All right. Um, simple ideas that we're starting to kind of like get a grasp of what's going on there. And I think Locke is like broadly, he seems to be on the right track, I would say. And I'm kind of curious if you guys think so too. If there is some kind of like empiricist version of like no innate ideas, so how do ideas happen? And like, well, it starts off with simple ones. They can come from sensation, 
They can also come from reflection, but as Nick was pointing out, like you can't have ideas of reflection until you've started to have some ideas of sensation, because that's the first time that any ideas come in. They come in from the senses, and then I might reflect on them, but those are two different ways of turning my homunculus's attention. Two different sources of my ideas, and we can break them up into this vague typology that seems like, eh, more or less... With the exception of like synesthetes, this seems like it works out pretty well. And there are all kinds of fascinating questions, like what about blind people who have never seen, but then their sight gets restored? All kinds of cool stuff to explore in here. But the broad strokes of like what Locke seems to be up to, does that seem like it's about right? And then we start making more complicated ideas out of those simple ideas in this way that seems to be more active. These were seemingly kind of like passively absorbed. Both sensation and reflection, while there's some kind of like willful activity of like which way you direct your attention. Once you have directed your attention, the sensations or the reflections are just like happening and you're passively, as Mitchell was saying, like passively feeling like you're just like watching it all unfold, either in your mind or out there in the world. There's a kind of an activity of the mind that's required for the making of complex ideas out of simple ideas that isn't just kind of like observe what's going on through your senses or observe what's going on in the theater of your mind, but do something with that. These complex ideas are a kind of an activity of the mind. And the way that Locke first begins to talk about these complex ideas are in terms of three distinct activities of the mind. What are those? Um, oh, question? Or you were just, you were like ready with the answer to the question I haven't even asked yet. All right. Um, combining, combining several simple ideas into one complex, like one compound. Yeah. Combining ideas so I can take multiple ideas, I can combine them, like the idea of like a baseball player and a baseball player and a baseball player and a baseball player and combine them into a baseball team, right? Something like that? Yeah. Um, that sounds like combining. Oh, yeah. Really? Ah, bringing together two ideas and not combining them, but talking about the relationship between them. Yeah, that's relating. Yeah, good. And last but not least? Separating them. Yeah, separating or abstracting. Simple ideas and complex ideas are interchangeable? Gosh, I hope they're not interchangeable. I can see how there might be some confusing overlap sometimes because something might seem like both a simple idea in one sense or maybe a complex idea in another sense. And maybe this comes back to what I was saying before. Sometimes you just grasp the idea all at once and take it simply. Sometimes you do something with that idea, like you pull it apart or you come to that idea by putting other things together. And I'm like... I'm not really sure what to make of those weird sort of ambiguities in Locke. If it means that like he just wasn't careful and he's kind of stumbling through this inquiry as he goes and says like when he's talking about power, for example, as a simple idea, he's thinking of it as a simple idea. And then when he gets to talking about power as a complex idea, he's thinking of it as a complex idea and he hasn't even recognized that like he's contradicted himself. I think he's smarter than that. I got a little confused when you mentioned like the passive power, but you mentioned like active and passive power, and then you took examples like sugar dissolving into um, yep. water and sticky water. The power to be changed by something else is what he means by passive power. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the real puzzle, I think, is going to be what, what kind of complex, if we're thinking of power as a complex idea rather than as a simple idea, which of these three things is responsible for creating our idea of power. We get some clues on how we might work through this and also I think some of the seeds of some serious confusion about complex ideas. And I, it's unclear whether or not like Locke is sowing this confusion by like having a, like just not a very careful sort of an inquiry or like the way that he's exposing that inquiry. And again, I, I think he's smarter than that. 
I think maybe what's going on is Locke is struggling with a really nasty problem, and he's kind of revealing it as a nasty problem for and any of the philosophers who are going to come after him. Because in addition to talking about these three activities of the mind that are responsible for the creation of complex ideas, he talks about three kinds of complex ideas. And those three kinds of complex ideas really mirror these three activities of the mind in an impressive way that like is really, really tempting to say that like they match up perfectly. But the more you start paying attention, the weirder those relationships get. Those three kinds of complex ideas are, thank you, substance, and relations. And the big obvious clue to like some kind of relationship between these is that we have a category of complex idea called relations and we have this activity in mind called relating. And I don't know about you, I'm pretty sure that complex ideas that we call relations are made by relating two simple ideas to one another. Does that seem about right? Modes seemingly made through which activity of the mind? Substances, maybe? We want to take that one on first. Because we have these other two kinds of complex ideas that are maybe going to get matched up with these other two kinds of activities of the mind. What is substance? Oh, yeah, go ahead. I think it makes sense. It's not what Locke is saying. So, yeah. What does he say about modes? He says modes are... He says something about, like, um, existing by themselves, and then he gives a word, like, examples, like, um, triangle, gratitude, murder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Triangle, gratitude, murder. These are examples that he gives of modes. Oh, no. Murder is a substance? No. He's talking about modes there, right? I'll ask you to I'll ask you to keep going. Like we're in big trouble if he means murder is a substance. Yeah. They don't exist by themselves. Modes. Yeah, modes are things that like don't exist on their own. So how do we come up with the idea? If they don't exist on their own, we have to have Yeah, we have to have, have abstracted it from some existing thing, right? This is why murder, like there is a person murdering somebody else, but like murder itself is an abstraction. It's an abstract idea. And I get the idea of murder or perhaps beauty might be another one. I get the idea of beauty from beautiful things. And maybe through different sensory modalities, maybe through reflection and sensation, both alike, I can get this idea of beauty. And maybe it comes to me simply, but like talking about it and kind of reflecting on like, how did I get that idea of beauty? I recognize that beauty isn't an independently existing thing. And I am always abstracting the beauty from beautiful things when I talk about it or when I think about it, when I am working with that idea. So the idea of beauty seems to be a mode in this way that it is created through separating or abstracting away things that can't exist on their own. Locke apologizes for using the word mode here in an unusual way. Usually mode is meant kind of like as a species. And we talked about this with Descartes, that there are various modes of thought, different kinds of thought, different species of thought. So he's using it in a peculiar way here. And he complains that like there just is no good existing word for like what I'm talking about here. He's completely full of crap. There a, is a perfectly good existing word at his time for this. And we've already discussed it. It's accident. Those qualities that belong to substances but can't stand on their own historically throughout the history of philosophy. And Locke should have known better on this one. We call those accidents. Yeah. So if I'm not getting it wrong, so like if, um, if like both like are about the accidents, like would the substances be like what, like what describe like the properties of the properties of the like what describes it or something? Like, Oh, okay, yeah, good, all right, yeah, good. that's the next obvious step, right? It's like we maybe kind of have a sense of what relations are, we maybe have a sense of what modes are, so then what then are substances? Substances are those things that do exist 
independently of other things. And what's the what's the last thing that we have left? Combining? Yeah. This does seem like it works with the usual understanding of substance. Whereas like we have all of these accidents, we have all of these qualities. Maybe this is actually what I sensorily perceive of something. I see you sitting there with your eyes and your nose and your mouth and your hair and all of these different things. And then you start talking and I hear your voice and I roll all of those things up and I say like, those all belong to the same thing. This marker, it's got a cap, it's got a body, it's got green parts, it's got white parts. It's over here, now it's over here, now it's, it's over here, now it's over there, it's all over the place. It, it, like all of these different sensory perceptions that you have, is it the same thing throughout? Because this at the end of the day seems to be what most philosophers mean, particularly in early modernity when they talk about substance. They're talking about the thingliness of things. What makes something one unified thing? Such that all of the qualities that belong to it are abstractable from it, but they don't exist on their own. They always have to inhere in the substance. Those are what we might call accidents or modes. So yeah, substances seem to be a way of combining things together and then kind of, boom, grabbing something as a unity. And usually the, like, the paradigmatic example of a substance that is like, typically unquestioned is you. A human being is a substance. Like, are there things that are definitely things? Probably, I would say. So what's an example of a thing that's definitely a thing? Well, Descartes says the first thing that he can think of is himself. Like, of all the things that are things, you are definitely a thing, right? And maybe the marker is a substance. It's a thing, right? And maybe there are other substances as well. And this seems all neat and tidy until we start thinking about some of the more exotic examples of complex ideas that Locke wants us to entertain. Like power. Is power a mode? Is it a substance? Is it a relation? When he talks about it, he talks about it as if it's a mode. Does that make sense? That like power isn't a thing. There are powerful things. And then I abstract power from it. And then I get this idea of power from seeing powerful things. When I saw powerful things being powerful, what was I watching? Like what did I, was that, was it just an abstraction? Was there something else at work as well? Well, there's that. That's going on at work here. But when I saw, like, you want to see power? Here's some power. <sighs> Where was the power? How'd you get that idea of power? Keep in mind, we can think of it as a complex idea now. So I saw something, I perceived something, and then I came up with the idea of power. What'd you see? That's when you saw the power? Yeah. The flexing? Not in the actual moving of the marker with my mighty fist? <laughs> Does my power reside in my ability to be a cause for an effect? We talked about power, like passive and active powers, right? And passive powers are like the ability to be affected by something. Active powers, the ability to be the cause of some effect. Do you remember when he talked about cause and effect? Was it in his discussion of modes? Relations, yeah. Relations seem to always come in twos, right? Father, son, that's a relation, right? Yeah. Cause, effect, that's a relation. Bigger, smaller, that's a relation. Ideas that I get by putting two other ideas next to one another and, and examining the relationship between them. Power seems to be inherently kind of located in the ability to cause effects. But cause and effect, that's a relation, not a mode. Ooh, that's weird. These categories aren't as clean as they seem. And John Locke, I think, seems to be completely aware of this. 
why stick with these concepts? Ah, maybe it's just like it's the first pass. Maybe it's like him, him trying to get a grasp on things and saying like, well, let's try to make some categories and see how that plays out. These categories get messy. Maybe it's okay that they get messy. Maybe every time I'm coming up with like any one particular complex idea, I am in fact doing it in lots of different ways. And I can try to understand that process by trying to like isolate those ways, but it might be the case that like they're always interacting in really, really complex fashions, such that power, I can think of it both as a mode and also as a relation, particularly as it concerns cause and effect. Is that right, that cause and effect is a relation? but power is a mode, but yet, ooh, they seem so intimately related to one another that it's kind of hard to tease one apart from the other as an idea. We got some other ones here. Let me get those on the board, and then we can, I think, open up just for like open discussion. Uh, bum, 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 bum. Space and time. What's up with those? What kind of complex idea is space? Or what kind of complex idea is time? And isn't even a com is it even a complex idea? The self. Is that a substance? It's the unity of all the various multiplicities of my experience. I have all of these sights, all of these sounds, all of these reflections. What ties them all together? There's one thinker of all the thoughts, and that's me. So I, myself, am a substance. But don't I also get that sense of substance as a power, as being the cause of like what brings all of the ideas together, being the thinker of the thoughts. That's a kind of an activity, right? That has me now thinking in terms of power, or thinking in terms of cause and effect. That reflecting on like, yeah, there's me and my ability to perceive. That seems like a power. So am I a substance? Am I a mode? Am I a relation between all of my experiences? Something like ties me together and makes me one thing. Particularly when I'm talking about ident identity, personal identity. What makes me just one thing? I have all these memories. I have all these experiences. I ate a piece of pizza. Then I went dancing. Then I vomited. Then I went home. Then I had a birthday party. Then I had an exam. And like all of these things, like what ties them all together and like makes them all one thing? Is that me and is that the substance? Is the tying all together and unifying? Or is it is identity a relationship between all of those things? A relationship that's different than diversity. <sighs> Freedom of the will. Any kind of freedom, but specifically freedom of the will. Is the will a simple idea that I get from reflecting on like all of my volitions? Is it a complex idea that's a mode that I abstract away from like any like all of the various like acts of freedom? Is it a power to have freedom? And in that sense a mode? Is it a relationship between like my ability to be cause of certain effects? These are really, really messy. And it might be because this business isn't really quite tuned up right. It might also be because these ideas are all weird ideas. And any attempt to classify them is going to be fraught with trouble. There was a hand, at least one. Yeah. Tony. Okay. I just can't help but like, think, uh, we're talking about the modes. It just brings me back to Descartes and like the whole formal reality thing. Like, huh. internal, like, yeah, that, I think that's the first time that we encountered that idea of like more and less reality on the basis of dependence or independence, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's similar, but instead of more and less reality, 
it's the like, can you exist independently or are you kind of like parasitic? If it's this kind of parasitic, there is no power without having powerful things. There is no beauty without beautiful things. It's not like the Platonists say where like the form of the beautiful is just stapled to the sky someplace and that's beauty. We can say it with the same, the same sort of thing with numbers too. Three, is three a thing? Or is three something that's abstracted from like collections of three things? So we can think of it that way as well. I see from your face that this is not helping, though. Sorry. Are modes not like internal concepts, though? Like something... Internal? Like, or, not uh, like a physical thing. These are all ideas, right? So they're, they're all internal concepts. Complex ones, simple ones, modes, substances, relations, they're all ideas. Maybe they're ideas that represent things. Substances in particular seem to be the ideas of the unifiedness of a thing such that it's an independently existing thing. Does that help? But it's always, it's the idea of the thing. The idea of marker seems to be a unification of lots of other different things. Does that make sense? Kind of? Kind of? You look unhappy. It might be just because like this ends up being a bit of a mess. But I think it's an interesting mess. I think in particular, it's interesting to try to figure out like where to put these things. And maybe the like the struggle and the resistance that we find, like the frustration in trying to classify these ideas and tease them apart as like distinct kinds of complex ideas. Maybe this actually reveals something to us. Either something about how to further kind of refine this sort of categorization scheme, or in terms of whether or not we want to have any kind of confidence in these kinds of ideas at all. The next person that we're going to read is going to be David Hume. And almost everything on the board here, David Hume is going to be like, ah, come on. That's just a nonsense idea. Um, Mitchell. I think the discussion about how he talks about language is arbitrary and there's a lot of limitations to it is like really important in, in discussing like all these relations and stuff. Yeah, so let's think so language is arbitrary in the sense of like the label, the sign that I attach to an idea is arbitrary. I can like, I've been calling this marker, but I can call it Richard if like we want to, right? This is Richard and this is Ted and this is Steve. And like, I can use that language that way if I want to. I'm not gonna be able to communicate with other folks unless I get them on board with the arbitrary labels that I'm attaching to things. Are ideas arbitrary? The words that I attach to ideas, that definitely seems arbitrary. Are ideas arbitrary? Like color and shape. Those aren't necessarily out in the world. If they're ideas, they're in a mind being thought, right? That's like John Locke 101. Ideas are things that are thought. So the ideas aren't the things. The ideas are the, the, what I think. Sometimes thoughts about things. Are these arbitrary? Are these ideas arbitrary? Are any ideas arbitrary? People packing up. Does that mean it's time to go? Oh, 3.15. It is time to go. <laughs> An interesting place to leave things. We'll pick up with David Hume at our next meeting on Tuesday. Enjoy the weekend. Try to stay dry. And I'll see you later. <laughs>